Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Argonne National Laboratory. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to kick off uh, this evening's events. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming out this evening for our, our final out loud lecture series lecture uh, for, of the year. Uh, we've already uh, lined up uh, three uh, Argonne Out Loud lectures uh, for the spring and early summer, and so look forward to hearing a bit more at the end of the talk this evening about what we have planned for uh, uh, spring and summer. So please uh, let me begin with my uh, formal remarks. Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Paul Kearns, the Interim Laboratory Director here at Argonne. I uh, recognize many of you and, and appreciate again that you're here this evening. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the lab and tonight's tour and lecture. Hopefully you took full advantage of the tour as well. It's my pleasure to welcome a special guest who will introduce tonight's lecturer. U.S. Congressman Bill Foster, who dis whose district includes Argonne, has long been a champion of our lab. Bill is proud to say that he is the only physicist in Congress, and during his former career at Fermilab, he was a member of the team that discovered the top quark, the heaviest form of matter. At Fermi, Bill also leads teams led teams that designed and uh, built scientific facilities and detectors still in use today. Needless to say, Bill's background gives him a unique insight into our priorities, our goals, uh, the opportunities the lab faces, and also the needs we have. We really appreciate his ongoing support. He's one of the uh, most outspoken champions for the laboratory, not only Argonne, but also for me in the U.S. Congress. We really do appreciate his sincere uh, support and passion for science. Bill has served in the U.S. House of Representatives since, uh, since 2008, in addition to his position on the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Bill has also served on the Committee on Financial Services. Please uh, welcome Bill Foster. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Wow, there's some uh, friendly faces in the audience. Um, <laughs> I, um, well, sometimes I introduce myself as saying that I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of physicists in the United States Congress. Um, I actually, uh, the first time I ran for Congress, uh, Leon Letterman, who's probably known to many of you, um, was, uh, was kind enough to spam the Nobel laureates distribution list uh, on my behalf. And, um, and so that as a result, my campaign ended up being endorsed by 31 Nobel Prize winners. Which, which I think is a record for a house race, um, but it was. Um, but then it went to 32 when Barack Obama got his Nobel Prize, but but that was just a peace prize, right? It doesn't really count. Um, anyway, look at I just you know you know we're here to um, commemorate something that's and, and discuss something that's really incredible. Uh, 75 years ago, um, in a couple months, uh, the first nuclear chain reaction. And you know, physics was different then. You know, you read the textbooks now, and you and you see these names of people that made incredible discoveries, and then you realize that you're seeing the same name again and again: Enrico Fermi in solid-state physics, and in uh, you know leading the effort uh, to make the first nuclear chain reaction, and hundreds of other places. And um, and you you realize also that the number of scientists that really understood you know, what was going on could fit in this auditorium or even a smaller one. And a huge fraction of those came together 75 years ago to see if it was really possible to make a nuclear chain reaction. And they succeeded, um, you know, at which point, you know, the, uh, it, it became clear that you really didn't want to do this like downtown in a university campus. And, <laughs> and rather quickly, um, they found a, a, a site which uh, eventually became, you know, where we are, Argonne Lab. But the, the effort uh, to study atomic energy rapidly bifurcated um, between, you had the weapons laboratories, you know, out in the desert, um, where, where the actual, you know, a lot of the things, you know, really dangerous things were built. You also had um, the production facilities, like Hanford, where they made large quantities of fissile material. Uh, and then you had places like Argonne that, that specialized in the science and in the technical support of reactors, not weapons. And so that, uh, that is really provided the seed of you know, this wonderful thing that is Argonne Lab today, because it's not only the, the nuclear part of it, it's, it's the chemistry, it is the technology, it's everything uh, connected to it that really you know, was the seed that, that bloomed into what Argonne is today. And so 
So 75 years ago, uh, you know, there was an incredible moment in time, and I'm sure you'll hear about that. I was um, just down at, at the start of the, at the celebrations or commemorations at the University of Chicago. They had a kickoff uh, meeting. And one of the, the big topics of discussion was the, um, the state of atomic energy today. And one of the most important things to discuss there was the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and you know, when, as the only PhD physicist in Congress, uh, it, it became very important. You know what I thought of the deal. And if you ever read the, the Iran nuclear deal, it's got uh, you know just pages of very complex technical things. There's actually a, a one-page chart of reactor core parameters that that described in detail what changes the Iranians had to make to their heavy water reactor so that it would never be useful. Uh, to make large quantities of weapons-grade plutonium. And so I, I, in the courts of trying to figure out, you know, if I was going to support uh, the, Iran, the Iranian nuclear deal, um, I had probably more than a dozen classified briefings, many of them individual classified briefings, um, trying to figure out, you know, what if the Iranians tried this? Could we detect it? Um, you know, could we stop it if they were limited to this amount of this material? or this, um, if they made these changes to their reactor, um, you know, would that actually, uh, you know, produce what was called the one-year breakout time of the deal? And so, uh, very rapidly, um, experts were needed, and I was thrilled uh, to see that those experts, which had been working at, for example, converting uh, research reactors uh, away from uh, you being dangerous devices uh, that could spread nuclear weapons to safe devices for scientific purposes, that that was an effort that had been led largely out of Argonne for decades. And so it was, it's, it's something that you have to be proud of, that the world, the majority of nations that used to have, you know, dangerous nuclear reactors with high enriched uranium uh, now no longer have dangerous reactors that can be used to make weapons. And it's because of the very quiet work done for decades at, at Argonne. And so the world's a safer place because of a lot of the work that has been done here. And um, I also found it tremendously convenient that, you know, very near my home in Naperville, I could go down to a, what's called a SCIF, a secure briefing room where you have a, you know, a very, you can have a classified briefing from anyone from around the country at a similar facility. They have one here at Argonne. And so I was able to really make contact with all the experts. Um, and when I stood, when I stood to give my press conference expressing my support for the Iran nuclear deal, uh, sitting at my side, standing at my side, were Ernie Moniz, the Secretary of Energy, and also um, Dick Garwin, who built the first hydrogen bomb and is just a legend inside, uh, inside classified things, things that cannot be talked about. Uh, but what, what struck me in reading about Dick and getting a chance to meet him is that Enrico Fermi, the guy who led, uh, led the effort to make the first chain reaction, called Dick Garwin the only true genius that he had ever met. And so that the number of, the number of giants that have, have walked in this field is, is really impressive, and I, I hope you'll, you'll learn um, some about it and read a lot more about it uh, afterwards, after you see the presentation uh, from Dave Grabaskus tonight. Um, you know, he's a, it, it's wonderful to see, you know, what I consider a young guy, you know, working hard, excited about the next generation of efforts in the nuclear field, because that's really, you know, it's part of what Argonne is and something we should all be proud of. Anyway, this is incredible history that you're going to learn about tonight and enjoy. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. You know, when they first came to me and asked if I wanted to give a presentation on the complete history of nuclear power, one of the world's most complex and sometimes controversial topics, and do it all in 40 minutes. Uh, I was a bit hesitant, but I can't pass up uh, the opportunity to, to tell a good story, and that's really what I want to do tonight. Um, some of you might have come to the Out Loud lecture earlier this year that my colleagues Bo and Francesco gave on nuclear power, and they gave a great technical talk about the, the physics of nuclear power, different types of reactors and fuel and things like that, but that's not what I want to do tonight. What I want to do is tell the story 
of nuclear energy as a power source. Because I think it's a very interesting tale with ups and downs and twists and turns, and a future that, at least here in the US, is still somewhat uncertain. So before I begin, a little bit about myself. I'm a nuclear engineer here at the lab, but my real position is a risk analyst. I, I do safety analysis for nuclear reactors and for other industries. Because of that, I, I like to think that I try my best never to uh, fall in love, so to speak, with a technology because it might influence the way that I do my job. It might um, affect the way that I honestly look at safety of a system. And so I'm going to try to take the same approach with the lecture today. I'm going to try to leave my own kind of personal opinions out of it and just kind of prevent the facts as they happen and the events as they happened. Now, with that said, I guess we'll start way back at the very beginning and the reason we're here in the first place and going all the way back to 1942 when a group of research staff who had been brought together as part of the Manhattan Project met here at Stagg Field, the old football stadium at the University of Chicago. Now, they actually met in the squash court underneath the stadium because it was a big empty room that they could use. This group, who was being led by Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi, had the goal to do something that had never been done before, and that was to create the world's first man-made self-sustaining nuclear reaction. Now, in December of that year, which makes it 75 years ago in two months, they achieved their goal with what was called Chicago Pile 1, CP1, which became the world's first man-made nuclear reactor, when it was really essentially just a big pile of graphite and uranium, but it got the job done for them. Now, I think most people know part of the tale after this. Their accomplishment was refined over the next three years, and finally culminated in the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and later on Nagasaki. But that really is only one side of the tale for nuclear energy. What I want to focus on tonight is the development of nuclear energy as a power source rather than as a weapon. You see, following those first initial tests downtown at the University of Chicago, the decision was made to move the Chicago pile out into the suburbs of Chicago. This was done not only for safety reasons, but also for security. You can imagine this was part of the Manhattan Project. It was top secret, so having it in the middle of downtown wasn't the best approach. The site they picked is essentially across the street from current day Argonne. It was called Site A. And when World War II ended in 1946, Site A was recommissioned as Argonne National Laboratory, which was the nation's first national laboratory. But what made Argonne really unique, and the congressman touched on this, was that unlike other facilities that came out of the Manhattan Project, places like Oak Ridge or Hanford or Los Alamos, the purpose of Argonne wasn't atomic weapons development. The purpose of Argonne was to investigate nuclear energy as a power source, and this made Argonne unique from all the other facilities. Now, for those interested, you can actually go visit the old Site A now. It's part of Red, uh, Redgate Woods right across the street. And you can even look to see where they buried Chicago Pile 1. There's this helpful marker that tells you don't dig there. Um, <laughs> so Argonne scientists were given the task of developing nuclear energy as a power source. And over the next couple years, they researched this aspect. And finally, in 1951, they built Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, which was constructed out in the desert of Idaho. Experimental Bre Breeder Reactor 1, or EBR1 as we like to call it, became the world's first nuclear reactor to produce useful amounts of electricity when it powered four light bulbs in the reactor building. So you have to start somewhere, so to speak. And, and to be honest, they are pretty big light bulbs, so I'll give them that. <laughs> now, EBR1 did this essentially in the same way that, say, a natural gas or coal plant produces electricity. You heat up water, you create steam, you use steam, and you turn a turbine and create electricity. But EBR1, rather than heating up water by burning coal or burning natural gas, used a nuclear reaction to create heat. And it actually used a, a liquid metal coolant, a mixture of sodium and potassium, to transfer heat to the water that would create power. And we, we sometimes think of salt now as a, as a, or sodium as a salt, but it really is a liquid metal. So we refer to EBR1 as a liquid metal reactor. Also, what was unique about EBR1, as the name implies, experimental breeder reactor, was that EBR1 demonstrated that breeding was possible in a nuclear reactor. What we mean by breeding is that 
a reactor that can actually create more fuel than it uses during the reaction process. So EBR1 was also a major milestone for nuclear in that regard. Now, EBR1 nowadays is actually a national landmark, uh, a historic landmark, and if you ever happen to find yourself out in the middle of nowhere in Idaho, I highly recommend, uh, recommend you stopping by and taking a tour. N now, for those of you who saw Bo and Francesco's lecture earlier this year on nuclear power, you probably know that there are many different types of reactors that are possible. EBR1 was one type. It was a liquid metal-cooled reactor, and it used high-energy neutrons to sustain the reaction. But there are different types that are possible. There's water-cooled reactors, salt-cooled reactors, gas-cooled reactors, reactors that use low-energy neutrons, uh, reactors that use thorium instead of uranium, and the list goes on and on. And during this time, there was a question, well, what type of reactor would really win out, so to speak, and kind of go on to achieve the ultimate success, which would be to produce electricity for the grid out on the, the commercial grid. But a very important event happens in nuclear power next, and it involves this man, Admiral Hyman Rickover of the US Navy. See, the, the Navy was interested in using nuclear reactors to power their submarines. If you remember back in this time, back in World War II, submarines used diesel mo motors for their power which meant not only did you have to carry around a whole bunch of diesel fuel on board the submarine, but every once in a while, the submarine would have to surface to get air for the diesel motors. As you can imagine, any time you surface in a submarine, you're vulnerable. So the Navy saw nuclear reactors as a potential solution to this problem, where the submarines would be able to stay submerged for a much longer period of time. The question was, well, what type of reactor should the Navy use in their submarines? Should they use one of these liquid metal reactors, similar to EBR-1, or should they use a different type, say maybe a water-cooled reactor, because, well, the submarine's going to be in water, so maybe that makes the most sense. So what the Navy did, kind of in typical government fashion for the time, was they built two. A lot of people know of the USS Nautilus, which in 1954, three years after uh, EBR-1, became the world's first nuclear power submarine. It used a water-cooled reactor actually designed by Argonne and tested out in Idaho before going on the Nautilus. What a lot of people don't know is that just a couple months later, the Navy launched the USS Seawolf. The USS Seawolf was also a nuclear-powered submarine, but it used a liquid metal reactor much more similar to EBR-1. And even though the reactor in the USS Seawolf, this liquid metal reactor, actually had better performance than the Nautilus. It produced more power in a smaller core. But there was not a whole lot of experience at the time with high temperature liquid metals and how they interacted with different components. And what happened on the USS Seawolf was that there were actually some leaks in the superheaters of the reactor, which aren't really part of the reactor, but they're what convert the energy to uh, what the submarine can use to power itself. In addition, the reactor on the USS Seawolf was a sodium-cooled reactor, kind of like EBR-1, and sodium does have this nasty habit of exploding if it touches water. So those two factors together, and it, it was really the superheater problem and the fact that the submarine had to be down for maintenance, the Navy decides to go with water-cooled reactor for their submarines. Now, this might seem like a minor detail, but what happens is that the government begins pouring a lot of money into water reactor development. They start funding Argonne to research water reactors. Uh, they look at different water reactor types. They begin funding and training crews to operate water reactors because they'll need them on their submarines. And what you see is that just a couple years later, when the decision is made to essentially take nuclear to the commercial electricity grid, which happens with the shipping port reactor, that, which was built in PA in the late 1950s, they essentially just use a scaled up version of the water reactor that was on the USS Nautilus. And actually, just to show how tight that connection was, the construction and operation of shipping port was actually overseen by Admiral Rickover of the Navy. Here he is standing in the pressure vessel of the shipping port reactor. So you can already see how that decision by the Navy is having consequences for commercial nuclear power. Now, shipping port proves successful, and soon more water reactors are built to provide electricity to the power grid. One particularly noteworthy one is Dresden 1, which was built about 45 minutes from here in 1960. 
Dresden 1 became the first nuclear reactor to produce power that was built without government funding. In addition, it's a water reactor that's actually built on a prototype that was built here at Argonne called EBWR. And if you're interested, when the lecture's over tonight, when you're leaving the APS, if you take a right-hand turn, you can actually still see the containment dome for, e for EBWR about a block away from here. Now, what makes these kind of initial steps for nuclear power in the U.S. particularly impactful, not just here in the U.S., but globally, is that in parallel, at the same time, President Eisenhower goes to the United Nations and makes a very important speech, what, what becomes known as the Adams for Peace speech. So you see, up until this time, even though it's been a couple years since World War II, nuclear technology is essentially still a state secret. The government does not openly talk about nuclear development. But President Eisenhower goes to the UN and talks about nuclear not only as a destructive force, but also nuclear as a potential energy source, as something good for mankind. And if you ever get a chance to listen or to read President Eisenhower's speech, I really recommend it. There's really some great lines in there. One I really like is President Eisenhower talks about finding the way by which the inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. So how can we use nuclear energy not to kill, but to actually improve the conditions for mankind? Hence the Adams for Peace theme of his speech. But one of the big results of this speech is that the U.S. begins exporting its reactor technology to other friendly nations. And as you can imagine, since the U.S. is doing a lot of research in water reactor technology, this is what it ex exports to the other countries in the world. So a lot of countries begin following in the U.S.'s footprints in water reactor development and water reactor research. Now these kind of initial steps with nuclear power, these initial plants in Eisenhower's speech, you really see the, the birth of the so-called atomic age in the US, where nuclear power is beginning to be sold as the potential solution to all life's problems in a way. Uh, heck, nuclear-powered cars, nuclear-powered airplanes, and, and yes, that, that is a real airplane, and yes, it does have a nuclear reactor on it. Um, luckily, the car never made it that far. Um, but there's a general thought that nuclear power as this clean, abundant source of electricity is really going to change the world. And you talk to Argonne scientists who were here at the time, and they really felt that they were taking part in something revolutionary. That just within a matter of years, the technology that they were working on would soon be everywhere. It would be powering all aspects of our life. The electricity and the power would be so abundant, it would be so cheap, that it would be world changing for everyone out there. And by the late 1960s, it kind of looks like this uh, premonition is coming true. The U.S. has over 40 nuclear power reactors either operating or under construction, with many, many more being planned and being ordered. But as I'm sure many of you happen to notice, we, we don't exactly live in that nuclear-powered utopia that the Argonne researchers envisioned back at this time. So what happened? Well. Beginning in the early 1970s, I would say reality begins to hit home for nuclear power in a way. It's also a time when the repercussions of choosing water reactor technology kind of begin to show themselves. So to kind of put it bluntly, water reactors can be a complex beast uh, sometimes. Especially the water reactors that were being built back then. They were essentially being built on the philosophy of design by extrapolation. So essentially, we had the small water reactor on a submarine. We'll make it bigger to produce electricity. We'll make it even bigger to produce more electricity, and so on and so forth. But as they got bigger, they were getting more complex. They were getting more costly. The construction times were getting longer and longer. In addition, for water reactors, in order to survive emergency situations, say situations where maybe they lose power, situations where a pipe breaks or something like that, they need additional safety systems, what we like to call engineered safety systems. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with this approach to safety. Lots of industries do safety in this way. But what it does do is that it makes the plants even more costly and more complex to build. And what makes matters even worse is that the federal government at this time is really just learning how to oversee nuclear power as an industry, how to regulate nuclear power. 
Heck, by the mid-1970s, they actually form a completely new regulator, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And regulation is constantly evolving, and there's new requirements being put on these plants, again, making them more costly and more complex. If these issues aren't bad enough, during the 70s, interest rates begin to skyrocket, and the economy begins to stagnate, which drives down electricity demand, makes the loans to build these plants even more expensive. And what compounds all these effects for the nuclear industry is that the, the manufacturers that are actually building these plants are essentially selling what they call turnkey plants, meaning you order a plant from them, they do the licensing, they do the construction, and at the end they hand you the keys of an operating nuclear reactor. But a lot of these companies are essentially taking losses on these first reactors. But it's okay because they're thinking, well, we're going to sell hundreds of these in the future. We can stand to lose a little money on these first ones being built. But with all these issues, costs are going up, construction times are getting longer, and their losses are getting even bigger. Now, if you couple this with the fact that in the early 1970s, that kind of atomic optimism of the 50s and 60s is starting to give way to a rise in an anti-nuclear sediment in the U.S., now, part of this can kind of be attributed to a carryover from anti-nuclear weapons sediment that was part of the Cold War, which is understandable. But there is also a growing real concern about the safety of the nuclear plants that are being built. You can imagine the U.S. is going from no nuclear reactors to many nuclear reactors over a very short period of time. For a lot of people who have maybe, maybe never even thought about nuclear power, they're suddenly getting a plant built very close to them. And it kind of raises that proverbial question, well, do you want one in your backyard, so to speak? And what this creates is almost a feedback cycle in a way, where the anti-nuclear sediment leads to the regulator being stricter, imposing new requirements, drives up costs, drives up construction times, protests drive up costs and construction times, which brings nuclear even more in the news as it faces troubles. And what you see by the mid-1970s is that the nuclear industry is really facing some tough times. Costs are going up, construction times are getting long, and by 1974, you essentially have the last new nuclear plant order of this time period. So you can see just how quickly the tide has turned for nuclear power in a way. From that first plant in the late 1950s to just a little over a decade later, you have a stop in the order of new nuclear plants. Now, to make matters even worse, in the late 1970s, just actually just two weeks after a movie comes out called The China Syndrome, which depicts, uh, for the young people in the crowd, which depicts a meltdown at a nuclear reactor, an event happens at this plant in Pennsylvania, at Three Mile Island. Now, due to a combination of mechanical failures, human error, bad procedures, and just some of the intrinsic properties of water reactors, Unit 2 of Three Mile Island suffers a meltdown. Now, fortunately, the, the off-site consequences, as, as we like to call them, meaning the, the health effects off-site, are, are small. But it only further cements kind of that growing anti-nuclear sentiment that's growing in the U.S. And it's worth mentioning that just a couple years later in the 1980s, a far worse reactor accident happens in Chernobyl, Ukraine which, despite those reactors not being anything like the reactors we have here in the U.S., just turns the sentiment even further against nuclear power. But I think it's, it's interesting to look back now, because it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, it was the accidents that led to the downturn in nuclear power in the U.S. But Three Mile Island happened in 1979. That last new plant order was in 1974, over five years before Three Mile Island happened. So Three Mile Island, or the nuclear industry was facing issues well before Three Mile Island even occurred. But that's not to say that Three Mile Island and later Chernobyl don't have a consequence, because they do. Because even though that last new plant order was in 1974, there were still many plants that had already been ordered and were under development and under construction in the U.S. And what you see following Three Mile Island is that there's a whole new slew of regulatory requirements. It's prolonging construction times. It's causing the plants to get even more expensive. And soon, you see a wave of nuclear power plant cancellations in the U.S. 
over 100 nuclear plants are, or 100 nuclear reactors are canceled in this time period, 16 in the year after Three Mile Island alone. And many of these reactors are being canceled after construction had already begun, meaning huge losses for the manufacturers, huge losses for the utilities and the ratepayers who were supporting them. So you can imagine that the, the sour taste that this leaves in the mouth of the manufacturers of utilities, because nuclear plants are a big upfront investment with a long payoff scheme. But these manufacturers and utilities put a bunch of money up front and are getting essentially nothing out the back end. So you can see why there's kind of a negative attitude for nuclear power on the commercial side for some period of time. And what you see by the mid-1980s is that there's a real question about, well, is nuclear power bombing out, so to speak? Has it kind of failed to deliver on its promise? Well, I think that's probably a little overdramatic. The nuclear industry in the US didn't disappear during the 1980s. But it definitely hit what I like to call kind of a stagnation or a stasis. And I think this plot on the next slide I kind of really tells the tale. So if you look at the number of operating power reactors here in the US over time, you had that initial surge um, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s where you had about 50 or 60 reactors built. Now, following 1974, you had more reactors being finished, but all of these had been essentially ordered before 1974. And you see the construction time on some of these are taking over a decade before these plants come online to show you just how impactful uh, those extensives were being. But once these plants are finished, there's no new, plants order, no new plant orders out there, and there's no new construction for the nuclear plants here. And what you see is a leveling off by the late 80s and into the 90s. So we end up here in the US with about 100 reactors uh, producing electricity. Altogether, they produce about 20% of the electricity. This was true in the 80s, it was true in the 90s, true in the early 2000s, all through this kind of stagnant period. And they're by far the biggest source of non-greenhouse gas emitting electricity in the US. Um, actually, you could pretty much take all other sources of non-greenhouse gas emitting electricity and nuclear is still bigger. But I think it's, it's interesting to look back and see that, well, these about 100 reactors produce about 20% of all our electricity. But over 100 more reactors were canceled during this period. So you can imagine just how big of a share nuclear might have been if these reactors had gone forward. Nuclear would essentially be the biggest source of electricity rather than coal or natural gas here in the US. Now, here in Illinois, it's worth mentioning that the picture is a little different. Illinois actually has the most nuclear reactors out of any state in the country. We have 11 of them. And they were all built in the 60s, 70s, or early 80s time frame. They produce about half of the state's electricity on any given day. And here around Chicago, the story is actually even a little different. We have essentially five nuclear power stations that kind of encircle Chicago in a way. So about maybe 80 to 90% of our electricity actually comes from nuclear power. Chicago is probably the most uh, nuclear-powered big city in the US. Now, that kind of shows where nuclear power had gotten to by the, by the late 80s. But this stasis kind of lasts for nuclear power through the late 80s, through the, the whole 90s, and into the early 2000s. But beginning in the early 2000s, things begin to change in a way. There's talk beginning of, well, electricity prices are rising, demand is expected to go up even higher. There's a growing concern over greenhouse gas emissions as, as global warming and climate change begins to be taken more seriously and about the emissions that are given off by coal and natural gas. And there are some conversations started, well, maybe nuclear is ready for a comeback, so to speak. Because while nuclear is a baseload, non-greenhouse gas emitting source of electricity, so it could fill this hole, and there's a general thought that, well, with nuclear, maybe we've learned the lessons of the past. We've learned the mistakes of the 70s and 80s with, with how water reactors were built and constructed. And we could build new nuclear that's cheaper, it can be constructed faster, it will be more efficient. And soon there's talk of a nuclear renaissance here in the US. With nuclear reactors being planned kind of throughout the country, but especially in the south, where demand is expected to increase the most. Now, it's not just actually here in the US, but internationally. A, a lot of developing countries like India and China are suddenly pursuing, pursuing very aggressive uh, nuclear growth policies. 
I, I remember this time very well because I was finishing up my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering right about this time. And I was debating whether to go to grad school. And if I did go to grad school, what should I study? And I went and saw some presentations on nuclear power. And in the presentations, they said, well, most of the nuclear engineers we have here in the US started in the 60s and 70s during the boom years. And they're all going to be retiring soon. And we're going to be building all these new reactors. We're going to need so many new nuclear engineers that this is a, a guaranteed job for the future. And so it, it's no coincidence that I then went on to get my master's and PhD in nuclear engineering. Uh, but unfortunately for nuclear power, in a way, history soon begins to start repeating itself. Beginning in the late uh, first decade of uh, the 2000s, natural gas prices begin to plummet, making natural gas plants extremely cheap to operate for the production of electricity. In addition, you have the economic downturn of 2008 and 2009. Now, this just destroys those projections of the big growth in electricity demand in the US, with, it, with actually some places in the US actually declining with their electricity demand. In addition, to make matters worse, in 2011, you have the triple meltdown that occurs at Fukushima Daiichi in Japan due to the great East Japanese earthquake and tsunami. And while the first two factors are kind of economic, the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, in a way similar to Three Mile Island, leads to a lot of new regulatory requirements, a lot of new costs uh, for new plants out there. And what you see are suddenly headlines that are eerily familiar to the days of the 70s and 80s, with new nuclear plants being canceled rather than ordered. And some plants being canceled after construction had already begun, with losses that are really staggering to, to comprehend. That's 16 billion with a B um, for a plant that was recently canceled. And what it really looks like right now is that the nuclear renaissance may really only result in two new plants being built in the US at the Vogel site um, down south. But somewhat unsimilar to the uh, downturn of the 70s and 80s is that it's not just new plants that are being affected. It's also that existing fleet of about 100 reactors that we have operating. You see, with the, the discovery of cheap gas due to fracking and the shale discoveries, in addition with more and more renewables coming on the grid, like wind and solar, which e even though they're intermittent, when they are producing power, they're producing power very cheaply. And nuclear plants cannot just throttle back when electricity is cheap and throttle back up when electricity is expensive. They essentially operate at 100% power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And some plants are actually losing money in the, mar in the electricity markets that they're competing. And you have some plants that are now closing before they're reaching the end of life, rather than to continue to sustain these losses. A particularly big one was San Ofri uh, in California. And in a, in a bad way, I like to think, is that a lot of these nuclear plants that are closing are actually being replaced by natural gas plants, which actually can throttle depending on the price of electricity. Now, that's, it's worth mentioning that there are many potential policy solutions that are being pitched right now to this problem. Um, not only here in Illinois, but in other states and even nationally, too. I won't get into the politics uh, of these, but essentially what they're trying to look at is, well, you know, nuclear is a baseload source of electricity. Yes, it does not produce greenhouse gases. Yes, it is very reliable and can go through many storms that other power sources can't. But so should we credit it in a way that we don't credit other sources of electricity? And that's essentially what some of these bills try to do. Now, again, I won't get into the details, but one thing I will do is I highly encourage everyone here to look into these issues, to learn about them, to learn about what they're really trying to do. As you see with this article down here, it's just from last week. So this is a very current issue that's still up for discussion, um, especially at the national level now. Now, that's not to say that this kind of latest nuclear downturn has affected everybody. Internationally, places like India and China are still pursuing very aggressive nuclear growth schedules. Essentially, what these countries are discovering or learning 
is that in order to provide the, the mass electrification that they want for their people, without literally killing their people through pollution, is that nuclear power has to be some part of the equation for that. Nuclear power might not have to be the only part of the equation, but it has to play some role for these countries. And they're continuing building many reactors, there's many that have already been built, and many more under construction and under planning. But what does that mean for the nuclear industry here in the US? You might have heard rumors, well, the nuclear industry here is really actually dying. Well, again, just like in the 1980s, I think that's being overly dramatic. I don't think the nuclear industry here in the US is dying, but I think it definitely is changing, and hopefully changing for the good. What we've seen in the past, say, four or five years, is suddenly a bunch, kind of a, a plethora, of new nuclear reactor startup companies formed. A lot of these are small companies kind of formed with venture capital. Actually, some, some fairly high-profile investors like Bill Gates and Peter Thiel, amongst others. And all this, although this is a diverse group of companies, one thing that they do have in common is that they're kind of looking back in a way. They're looking back in time to that decision made by Admiral Rickover and the Navy to pursue water reactor technology. And they're questioning, well, was this really the right choice for nuclear power as a commercial entity? And what we've seen is suddenly kind of a resurgence in alternative reactor technology. Say, liquid metal reactors like EBR-1 and like the USS Seawolf was, uh, salt-cooled reactors, gas-cooled reactors, uh, thorium-fueled reactors, even some companies looking into fusion. Um, and here at Argonne, we've been working with a lot of these companies, um, helping them with their, their core designs, their plant designs, their fuel designs, um, and safety and risk analysis, if I give a little plug for myself. But what I think is really interesting about a lot of these companies is the way that they're leveraging work that has been done here at Argonne over the past couple decades. You see, even though there was this kind of stagnation in commercial nuclear power here, research into nuclear energy did not stop here at the lab. Instead, research kind of focused on addressing some of those issues that water reactors present. Things like, well, can we design a core that shuts itself down rather than depending on an active engineered system? Can we make a plant that can cool itself rather than needing pumps and electricity and things along those lines? Can we create fuel that's more robust and can survive more conditions or go to higher temperatures to produce more electricity or more power? And what we see with a lot of these new companies is that they're beginning to leverage this technology. Our Argonne has had a tough time due to this stagnation in commercial nuclear power about getting these technologies to break through to the commercial sector because there hasn't been much of an appetite to take risk in the nuclear industry lately. But now that nuclear is really looking to innovate, partly because it has to innovate to stay relevant, you're having companies leverage this technology and actually starting to incorporate them into their designs. So with that, so where do I think nuclear power is really going here in the US? I, I like to think of these new nuclear reactor companies, and this may be a bit of a stretch, but it's the way I like to think of it. I like to think of these companies kind of in the same, same stream as, say, a company like Apple. Apple didn't invent MP3 players, they didn't invent smartphones, they didn't invent tablets. But what Apple was able to do was they were able to innovate in a way, to modify these products in such a way that they had a breakthrough. Suddenly they were palatable to the masses, suddenly everyone had to have them. I wonder, can one of these new nuclear companies innovate in the same way for nuclear? Now, nuclear has now been around for 75 years in December. But can one of them reshape it in such a way that nuclear has that same type of breakthrough? Where suddenly nuclear is the thing that a utility has to have or that a company that's operating data centers or using power for, for some other big operation that they have to have in their operation. Can one of these companies suddenly have a breakthrough to where nuclear is now an order of magnitude cheaper than coal or natural gas? Or where a plant can be constructed in a year rather than a decade and for millions rather than billions of dollars? Now, I don't know if that innovation will really happen, but I think one thing that I can say confidently is that if one of these nuclear companies can get there, that Argonne, in the same way that Argonne was there in those pioneering days of the 50s and 60s and 70s, Argonne will be there working with them to help make it a reality now, too. So with that, 
I'd be happy to take any questions, and I think I got that in under 40 minutes, too. So. <laughs> Nice work, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got plenty of questions in the crowd this evening, so please, just right down here to start. Thank you. A two-part question. Uh, the Soviet Union obviously didn't, we weren't helping them in any way when they developed their nuclear program. Did they use a similar type of uh, water cooling system? And this, the second part, is, is there any example of all of the nations that do have nuclear reactors that use some kind of different cooling system other than water? That's a really good question. So actually, the Soviet Union kind of actually did end up down a similar path as the US with, with water technology. Actually, their, their primary reactor was called VVER, which the VV stands for water, water reactor in Russian. Um, but the, the general plant design was much different, but there, there was still water involved. And you see a lot of countries especially those in the developing world which are taking those initial steps into nuclear, uh, like China, like India, is that they are still starting with water reactor technology because countries like the US and Russia have experience with them. But I think what you see is, is countries like China and Russia uh, and India is they now have plans in place to transition out of water reactor technology sometime in the near future. Uh, Russia has actually built several uh, liquid metal cooled reactors recently and the hope is to build even more in the future and kind of transition to that. In China they just built their first uh, liquid metal reactor a couple years ago. They actually have a high temperature gas reactor coming on later this year or early next year. India actually wants to go on along the same route with liquid metal reactors but hopefully to use thorium because they have a lot of thorium in their country so they want to use that. So I think there is kind of a general thought that for these countries, they're going to transition there eventually. But to get things going fast, they essentially imported water reactor technology from places like Russia and places like the US. But that's a good question. Hi. Uh, first, thank you for the lecture. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Argon for providing these lectures and making them available to the public. Uh, my question deals with the size, the physical size of, of reactors. You know, we see commercial plants, the amount of real estate that they take up. We think about a submarine, a much smaller space, mm. um, and, and even down to, you know, back in the 50s with potentially putting one in a car, in, in theory. Is there a, 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 a lower limit to a complete working nuclear reactor to generate electricity? I, I think there... Theoretically, there might not really be a, local, a lower limit, but, but we do see a, a practical kind of lower limit to reactors. Essentially, kind of the, the lower limit that we've seen for commercial reactors is in, the, is in the couple megawatt range, where, say, in comparison to the water reactors that are out there now, are in the thousand of megawatt range. Um, the thought with these really small reactors is that, well, we can uh, get markets like maybe up in Alaska or very remote places in Canada, or, or maybe for the military where they just need a small amount of power in a very small area. But I think a, a lot of those new reactor companies are looking at reactors that are, are smaller in comparison to the water reactors we have out there now. They're, they're not looking at kind of what we call the, the monolithic uh, water reactor that produces many thousands of megawatts of electricity. And there, there's been some talk of developing what they call a small modular reactors where maybe one way we can ease that, uh, that big upfront cost for nuclear is we'll, we'll build a small one, we'll just build a couple small ones at a site rather than build one gigantic reactor. Um, but that does have some efficiency problems, but there, there are companies looking into doing that, and most of the, the new companies are planning smaller designs be, because of that. Help, help lessen that initial hurdle to get going. So, so that's a good question. He was asking about, well, what about the real physical size of the reactor? So uh, and it might be surprising that, that some of these advanced reactor concepts, the, the not water reactor concepts, the actual core itself, the actual nuclear core, m might only be a little bit bigger than this. I mean, it, it's really, we're talking about maybe several meters um, beyond that. But what has really made nuclear plants so 
big in the past, and by big I mean the amount of uh, real estate that they take up, is that they've historically had, had very large site boundaries. So we've, we've kept people far away from the actual nuclear plant. There's various reasons for that, for security reasons, for reasons if there was an accident, there's a, a big buffer zone. But a lot of the new reactors are looking at, well, if we can put in some of these new technologies to address safety, can we actually get rid of this big kind of site boundary? Can, can we actually site at, say, the reactor building rather than having you know, hundreds of acres of empty land that we don't do anything with? Uh, a lot of the new companies are actually looking into that. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the U.S. has actually said that they're open for that if you can demonstrate that you're you know, sufficiently safe to do that. So I think if new nuclear goes forward in the U.S., you're actually going to see that. The, the plant sites are not going to look like the old water reactor plant sites that just take up huge amounts of land. So. Question over here. Oh, uh, getting back to the question that was asked a little uh, a moment ago in your, your response to it, it seemed like maybe, oh, I don't know, five years ago, there was much more interest in the small modular reactors, and that seems to have sort of fizzled out since then. Do you know what happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it's one of those questions that if you ask 10 people, you might get 10 different responses, but I'll kind of give my opinion. Um, part of that, I think, is just the, the general downturn, or the electrical markets just being in general less attractive as gas has gotten cheaper and, and things along those lines. So there's just less interest um, in building new plants. But I think there was also, there, there was the thought, well, these small modular reactors, at least the first ones being pitched, were still kind of water reactor technology. They were just small water reactor technology. And that, well, if we go small, we can learn the lessons of the past with water reactors, but then we can keep down the capital costs and, and do all of those things. But did that really start to come true once they got into the detailed design phase? Uh, and I think we saw some companies kind of fizzle out once they actually started to get into the detailed design and really run the numbers about what the costs were going to be. But now, that's not to say that all companies went away. Um, one that is still moving forward is called New Scale. That's out west. They're actually looking to build a prototype uh, water reactor, a small modular reactor at the, at the old Idaho site, just a, a mile or two from actually where EBR1 is located. So we'll, we'll see if that goes forward. But they're actually doing site planning uh, right now for the reactor. Question over here. Right here. Thanks for taking our questions. I really appreciate oh. it. I was wondering if you could briefly uh, tell us what shape the inventory is in right now in terms of life expectancy. Are 60% of our reactors past their 60% or 80% of their life expectancy? Or where are we in terms of, of, of that? that that's, a, that's a really good question because uh, you know, we still have reactors out there that were built in the 60s and uh, early 70s that are still operating. Um, most of them got life extensions to 60 years through the regulatory process. Some are looking at potentially moving to 80 years through the regulatory process. There is some burden that goes along with this. They have to demonstrate you know, that essentially all the reactor internals can sustain this many more years going. And I think, I'm trying to think if I've, if I've seen any plants that have gone after a life extension and not been able to get it. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, most have been able to demonstrate that, hey, we can keep operating for another decade or two. But I think what you're, what you're really seeing now is the premature closures based on economics rather than the closures uh, based on life expectancy. Or you may have plants that were getting to an end of a life expectancy, and rather than renewing, they're shutting down because of the economics that they're in. So I, I don't know what exact percentage. Uh, again, most reactors were built late 60s through the 70s. Some were finished in the 80s, so you can do the math about where we're getting to with uh, life. Question in the center. Yeah, I had a question about where we stand with nuclear waste disposal. Is Yucca Mountain ever going to open? Uh, I understand there's some innovative approaches with burning uh, nuclear waste in a, a particle accelerator and these kind of things. So where are we right now? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and, and one kind of I skipped over um, in the presentation. But what there's, well, it really deserves a presentation all of its own just on that topic. But there's the question about, OK, well, what should we do with the fuel that's coming out of water reactors? And again, this kind of gets back to one of the characteristics of water reactors were that they, they really weren't designed to consume their own waste in kind of the same way that maybe uh, an EBR-1 was or other potential reactor designs were. 
Uh, there just there wasn't that need or that desire back in the, the very early days. So now we have most of the spent nuclear fuel that comes out of the reactor, which j just for those who don't know, but when we just talk about nuclear waste, we just mean the fuel rods that had been in the reactor for three years and we pull out those fuel rods. Not, it's not the bucket of green waste that some people sometimes think of. Um, but most, right now, most of that waste just stays on site at the nuclear plant in either a cooling pool or they put it in casks where it just sits there. But truthfully, there, there's still a lot of life left in that fuel. The, the water reactors don't utilize most of the energy that's in that fuel where other type of reactors can. And actually, some of these new reactor startup companies are pitching ideas of, well, we can actually utilize that fuel in our reactors in different ways. Um, there, there are some hurdles to some of those ideas where you have to reprocess the fuel first. Reprocessing can be expensive. Um, the U.S. has been hesitant to reprocess in the past because it's technically feasible to pull out, say, plutonium, and you could use that to make bombs, which we don't care about here in the U.S. We have all the plutonium we ever need for bombs, but we've been afraid about that technology being exported to other countries, so we haven't done it here in the U.S. But I think that's... It's a possibility. I think with the, with the latest administration, you've seen a resurgence of interest in Yucca Mountain of just, well, we take the fuel out of the reactors and we'll put it there at least for the time being. Whether that actually moves somewhere in the near future, um, that might be for people more in the political know than me, um, but we'll see. Question over here, please. Where do you see fusion going in the future and fitting into the puzzle here? Uh, well, I'll, I'll warn you, you're talking to a fission guy. Um, so th there's, there's a joke amongst us fission guys that fusion is always 50 years away. You know, it was 50 years away in 1960, it was 50 years away in 2000, and it's 50 years away today. We might be making some progress down that line. Um, I don't know enough of the detail about all the fusion plants to give a really educated opinion. I'll, I'll say one thing that I have seen by the, f the fusion concepts that are out there is that they're fairly complex and complicated. And I think if one thing we've learned from the water reactors that we've deployed in fission world is that we really want to be heading in the opposite direction. We want to be simplifying, making things as simple and easy to construct as possible, not complicating things. Um, you know, we know how to do complicated fission. Um, do we just want to add complicated fusion to that? Um, but hopefully, in the future, they're able to make those breakthroughs to get to that stage. I, I really don't know what that timeline might look like to get there. Uh, Dave catches a breath. Uh, there, are, uh, much like uh, fission, there are a number of uh, new startups as well in fusion energy technology. So uh, I've seen a lot of uh, new investors and uh, young entrepreneurs really pursuing pursuing new concepts in nuclear uh, nuclear fission. That's very good fusion. I'm sorry. Question down here, I believe. Yeah. Th thanks for your insights tonight. Um, sorry to go back to the small modular reactors, but I've been I've been looking at some and studying some up in Canada. Triso fuel. 5 megawatt, 10 megawatt small modular, uh, invented, the fuel invented here, but not being able to be utilized here for whatever reasons they're doing it in Canada. Um, they seem to have gotten rid of all of the issues involved in nuclear fuel. They, they, it's, it, you can't get a, the fuel to weaponize it. It's, uh, it's thermal spikes are self-regulating, and they've already booked repositories for the waste. Do you think that those kind of, kind of dispersed grid types of reactors could get to the point where they're uh, compatible with the grid and, and a similar kind of pricing mechanism? Yeah, I, I think, so f for those who might not know, he's, he was discussing triso fuel particles, which triso fuel are essentially these, these very small kind of fuel kernels that are coated with very strong materials that make it very difficult for them to melt or break or, or release the, the radioactivity that we don't like to be released. The, the U.S. actually, the Department of Energy has had a, a pretty aggressive research program into triso fuel development here in the U.S. So, say over the past decade, uh, a lot of that work's being done at, out, out at Idaho National Lab with, with, with some help here, but developing, kind of going through the fuel qualification process because uh, unfortunately that can be a painful process in the nuclear industry because you need to, to see how fuel performs, you need to irradiate it and maybe you need to irradiate it over years to get the type of testing that you want out of it. But I, I think there is promise there. Um, I, I think that's kind of the first part of your question. The second part I kind of consider a little separately. Do I think there might be a place for small nuclear in the future? 
And I think that, that might be true. I actually had kind of an eye-opening experience a couple months ago. I went to a conference uh, by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. It was called the Power and Energy Conference. So there were a lot of people there from the utilities, um, people looking into other sources of power outside of nuclear. And it was funny, of all the presentations I saw from all the utilities, none of them were talking about building new giant power plants like we used to see with nuclear. They were all talking about, well, how are we going to cope with the distributed grid in the future? How are we going to cope with a bunch of little power sources rather than a couple big ones? And I think nuclear might have the opportunity to, to still be a viable alternative in that model um, where other sources of power, um, maybe you know, coal doesn't look as appealing when you're building really small coal plants. Um, so I think in the future we're going kind of through that uh, distributed grid model anyway, so nuclear better be ready if, to be a part of it if it's gonna be there. <clears throat> so. Back here, standing up. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, they, the Robin McDaniel here. Um, could you maybe address some of the issues that we've been talking about in, in past about intrinsically safe nuclear reactors? And then also maybe the, the application, not just for making electricity, but for hybrid applications where we can use the heat for multiple sources. Thank you. Sure. So uh, I'll take that question in two parts. The first one was kind of discussing uh, inherent safety, which I touched on very briefly there at the end with some of the research Argonne has done. Uh, typically what we mean by uh, inherent safety, rather than I, I use the term uh, kind of, uh, an engineered safety system. By inherent safety we mean, say, a reactor where if it loses its cooling due to an emergency, if temperatures rise, the reactor, just because of the way it's built, makes power go down automatically, rather than having any safety system that needs to do that. And Argonne has built prototypes of these type of reactors in the past. Uh, actually, one was called EBR2, the, the one that came after EBR1, kind of demonstrated that this was possible in a reactor. Um, having a core that shuts itself down is one aspect. Having a core that can actually cool itself through what we call natural circulation, meaning if you have something hot down here and cold up here, just by uh, the difference in temperature, you can actually establish flow without any need for pumps or any need for power. And that if you can actually utilize this, you can cool a reactor even if you have no power on the site during an emergency. So you can utilize these factors to not only make the reactor more robust to accident scenarios, but also hopefully make it cheaper by not having to need these active systems on site. The second question, I'm trying to think back to what it was. Uh, Oh, hybrid, yeah. So some of these new nuclear reactor companies are looking at, well, what if we look at nuclear as a power source but outside of just electricity production? Um, say if you use a high temperature gas reactor to create hydrogen, because you, t you need very high temperatures to create hydrogen, but you can get those very high temperatures in a nuclear reactor. Or if you build a very small reactor, what if you station it at a refinery which consumes huge amounts of, of power? and they can provide all the process heat that they need right on site and they don't have to depend on the electricity grid or, or a nearby uh, coal or natural gas plant. So I think you, you are seeing more interest in these. There's kind of that hurdle of, well, who will be the first one to, uh, to take on that, um, so to speak. I think the, the SMR being pitched in Idaho is, is trying to get that, but you also have some companies here in the US looking at the oil drilling in northern Canada as an opportunity where uh, to get to these very remote sites, they're actually relying on diesel motors and they have to actually fly in diesel fuel to power these motors. So it's, it's incredibly expensive for them to get electricity out in these regions and that, hey, maybe one of these uh, companies might be brave enough to take on kind of that first, uh, first of a kind small nuclear reactor to provide power at the site. Very good. Question over this way, please. Yeah, thank you for your uh, fine lecture. Uh, could you talk about the status of the IFR, the integral fast reactor that was developed here at Argonne from 84 to uh, 94, and it was shut down for political reasons by uh, President uh, Clinton? Uh, there's a book on Amazon available by the developers, you know. But wh what's the status of that? It's 33 years ago. Is that still on the shelf? Has anyone else looked at it around the world? So, so what he's discussing, for people who might not know, was that there was this, this concept which actually built on the success of uh, EBR2, that, that one prototype reactor, called the Integral Fast Reactor. It was one of these 
a concept for one of the inherent safe uh, reactors. And there was a lot of research done here at Argonne in the late 80s and early 90s before, as he mentioned, the program was terminated in the early 90s, which, again, I won't get into the, the politics of that. But I think what you have seen lately is a lot of these new nuclear reactor startups are actually leveraging the work that came out of the IFR project. You have companies like TerraPower, which is Bill Gates' uh, reactor company, uh, essentially building a modified version of the IFR reactor. You have uh, companies like GE and Advanced Reactor Concepts, uh, ARC, are working together on a, on a smaller version, again, pitching to Canada uh, for it, but again, based on IFR technology. Um, you have a company, Oaklo, which is looking at a, a very small version uh, kind of of the IFR concept, but with some few simplifications to go down to a very small size. So I won't say that the IFR is dead, but it's kind of evolved from a national lab project. Now it's taken that next step into industry concepts. And, the quest and the, that's part of the reason why we're working with so many of these uh, companies and industries. They're utilizing that knowledge here. But now the next step is to get one of those companies to the actual construction and operation phase for it. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, I'm, I think we have uh, one more question from an adult, and then I'm going to ask if any students have a question or two, and then uh, we're going to thank Dave for his uh, talk this evening. Please, here in the center again. Yeah, my, my question is um, it, whether or not Argonne or perhaps any of the other national labs are working with the regulator uh, to help develop some of the expertise that's going to be needed to provide regulations for the, the newer generations of plants? No, that, that's a really good question. Um, you can imagine the, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the past um, 40, 50 years has pretty much done nothing but license water reactor technology. And there's been a real serious question, well, what if somebody was actually to go to the NRC to license an alternative reactor technology? You know, how much time is it going to take the NRC just to get up to speed on it to actually do the licensing process? Luckily, this has been identified as a major need, I'd say, in, within the past three or four years. And the DOE has actually uh, been working with the NRC directly um, to bring NRC staff up to speed on alternative reactor technologies. We've actually begin, been going to DC, giving training seminars on these lectures. We've been going there and actually testifying as experts on alternative reactor technologies to, to help them get to that next level. And I, I think I, I credit the NRC. You know, regulatory agencies can be very slow to move sometimes. And I credit the NRC for realizing that this might be an issue and actually kind of being proactive and, and working towards it and, and being open to taking outside help to, to kind of accelerate things. So. Very good. Question down here in the front row, Dave. So I was wondering if, no, this, these are two questions. So first question is, which which type of reactor is more efficient, water or sodium? And the second question is, is it possible to build something like a, th like a thorium reactor that could use like previous um, like radioactive waste, but recycle it and then reuse it and continue using that for like longer than it, that longer than it would have normally been used? No. Those are, are good questions. Um, there's several different ways you can define efficiency, but I, I would say in most factors, yes, a, a liquid metal reactor can, will be more efficient than a water reactor. There's a couple of different reasons for that. One, a liquid metal reactor can get to much higher temperatures than, than a water reactor. Water boils at a lower temperature, which makes it difficult to go to these really high temperatures. But the higher you go in temperature, the more efficient your power conversion cycle gets. So that, that's one big attribute. Another way is in the way it actually utilizes the nuclear fuel itself. A liquid metal reactor can actually use more of the usefulness in the fuel than, a, than in the way a water reactor can. Water, water reactors are much more delicate with how much fuel you have in there. Um, and I've, for the second part of the question, is it possible to have, build a, a thorium reactor that, say, can burn waste? Yes, uh, it is. The, the one difference with, between thorium and uranium is well, uranium you can dig up, you can refine it, and you can run a nuclear reactor on it. Thorium, you have to actually put it into a nuclear reactor first before you can run a nuclear reactor on it. So there's, there's an additional step in there. But yes, you, you can actually run a reactor on thorium. And, and again, India is looking very heavily into this possibility in the future. And both with, with thorium or uranium, 
you can design a reactor that we call a, a burner reactor. What we mean by that is it's a reactor where you can take spent nuclear fuel, you can put it in the reactor, and the reactor will essentially break down a lot of those radioisotopes that are radioactive for a very long time. I mean, if you just take fuel right out of a water reactor and stick it in the ground, it might be very radioactive for thousands of years. But if you were to put it in a burner reactor first, it might only be very radioactive for, you know, 100 years, so to speak. And so, hence the name uh, burner reactor. But okay. again, it's an additional step. Yeah. So. One last question, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you used the term climate change. Uh, I, uh, I spent my career at US EPA, and as you probably know, the scientists at that agency have been pretty much silenced on that issue. I just wonder if DOE has come down on you folks at all on the issue of climate change. I, again, you did mention it, and I appreciate that. Well, this might be a question better, <laughs> better for your skill set. Uh, yeah. uh, Pass the buck, right? Pass. Yeah. Let, me, I, let me earn my keep. No, no, so no, thank no, you, no. thank you. Uh, you know, certainly, certainly the conversation has changed. Uh, there's no expli explicit, uh, if you will, uh, discouragement um, from the Department of Energy to talk about climate change and, and to be concerned about it and to do active research in the, in the area. I think uh, the audience we have, the uh, leadership we have today is a bit more skeptical and, and therefore it really requires us to, to work a bit harder and, and make sure that our science is of uh, first, first rate quality. So. Uh, there have been a lot of questions, and we're in the dialogue, uh, but there's been no bar or discouragement or really in terms of uh, really uh, very active uh, investigation and, and discussion on climate change. So it's been healthy in that way. Well, I will say, um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure we got a couple of questions from students tonight, and my reason for that is uh, one of the encouraging things about nuclear energy and the development of advanced technologies is that nuclear energy really has become a young person's game. Uh, <laughs> Dave represents, if you will, uh, what we would call here at Argonne as the next generation. Uh, he's part of a team, uh, really, of uh, bright young scientists and engineers that have really come to Argonne to really continue, if you will, the work that uh, not only Enrico Fermi, but I suspect many in the audience also participated in or contributed to in terms of their career. And so let's thank him uh, one more time, please. <laughs> Very good. I, I promised a little insight into what we had planned uh, for the spring and early summer. We have uh, three Argonne Out Louds uh, uh, on the book, so to speak. First is John Carlisle, who will uh, continue the discussion about chain reaction. This is called Chain Reaction Innovations, which is really about uh, the laboratory working with startups and entrepreneurs uh, to really shake up the future of energy. And so we that's scheduled for March. In May, we'll have uh, Ralph Mohazen to talk about the role of science and engineering in the redevelopment of cities, particularly in the Midwest here, certainly of great concern, not only in the Chicago area, but think about Detroit and other uh, really fine mid Midwestern cities. And in July, we'll have a talk about uh, uh, assessing the risk associated with severe weather from uh, Raul Katamarthi. So we're very pleased to, to have uh, those lined up and look forward actually to everybody returning uh, take a break over the winter, but returning in uh, March with uh, a discussion, if you will, on chain reaction innovation. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Please uh, drive safely.